I'm a research psychiatrist and have been for over 35 years and also a practicing psychiatrist. And I've had a concentration on obsessive compulsive disorder for many years. And it was in studying obsessive compulsive disorder that I was able to apply this notion that I've had for even longer than that, that you're not just your brain and that you can do things with your attention to change your brain. And obsessive compulsive disorder was a very good condition to study, to advance that perspective because obsessive compulsive disorder really is significantly a brain mental health disorder. Um, in, in fact, it's very arguably the best understood of all mental health disorders from a brain perspective. And um, so people get in obsessive compulsive disorder, they get intrusive, unwanted thoughts and urges, often about washing, checking, that things aren't clean enough, that things um, are unlocked, that things need to be redone. And it's very important to understand the condition to know that the people on some level know that that's not really true. And when we studied um, their brains, we found out why a thought or and a feeling that they basically know isn't true bothers them so much. And, and it is because there is a brain circuit. There literally is a brain circuit um, that actually connects a part of the brain called the orbitofrontal cortex that sits, you know, right above the eye sockets. And, um, and then it, there, that area of the brain is connected to um, basically a gear shifter is a simple way to put it, but a reasonable way to put it. And essentially when something has been checked enough or a person basically feels like, okay, I understand what that is. I'm okay with that. Then the gears can shift and you move on to the next thing. And it turns out that the gear shifter is the core part of what gets called the habit center. It's a structure called the caudate nucleus, um, part of a set of a structures called the basal ganglia. And, and this structure, um, another name that it goes by actually in, in, in all mammals um, is the striatum. And, and so the striatum is a habit center. And, and that's obviously very consistent with being a gear shifter. Um, and so when people have, be, you know, have habitual behaviors or anything you do really repeatedly gets wired into that area of the brain, and that area of the brain can run the outer surface of the brain called the cortex um, very, very quickly and very, very automatically so that you can do very, very efficient behaviors very, very quickly without having to think about it at all. In fact, it, it's really unconscious. And, and it's, it's, it's literally automatic behaviors. Um, and we all have a lot of them. And it helps make life much, much, much easier than, I mean, life wouldn't be possible without it. I mean, even the action of getting out of this chair would be very complicated if you had to think through every movement you had to make to do it. So, so, so a very large part of our, of our behaviors are wired by the, 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 these habit mechanisms in, in the striatum. And in obsessive compulsive disorder, um, there is a problem specifically shifting that as I say, cortex area of the brain called the orbitofrontal cortex, and it gets stuck in gear. And, and when it gets stuck in gear, you, you get bombarded with feelings that things aren't right, that things need to be checked, that things might be dirty. Um, and and th therein lies 
basically a brain mechanism for understanding this neuropsychiatric disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. So the idea that I had about how to utilize that information in ways that could show that um, people with OCD, even though there's something that is not really working quite right in their brain, could, could really do a lot about it, is, is by training people, literally training them to reinterpret the feelings that you need to check or that something is dirty, um, reinterpret it as a false message from your brain. And I developed this four-step method in that came out in a book called Brain Lock over 20 years ago. And um, that method basically told people to relabel and, and say, wait a second, I don't really need to check that again. That, that feeling of needing to check or that feeling that something is dirty, that is really not what it sounds like it's not what it says it's 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 false and then and then you reframe it and understand it as an obsessive thought or a compulsive urge to wash to check or other bad thoughts that people get turn light switch on and off there's just a, a usually large number of behaviors that people start to do repetitively for no real reason other than they're getting these false brain messages. So once you relabel and, and reframe, or in the original version for OCD, we call reattribute it and say, that's just my brain, then you can really refocus your attention on other behaviors. Now, that's hard to do when you have OCD, especially because your brain is like pulling your attention towards the thing that is bothering you. But but it turned out that um, people could, in fact, learn how to understand that this is not me, this is a false message from my brain, and learn how to refocus their attention. And when they did that, their OCD improved and their brain changed. So that, that was really where the whole science part of this really came in, because, because we did these studies using... Um, brain imaging at UCLA um, in the in the 80s into the 90s, and um, and repeatedly showed in work that has now um, been repeated and have become standard work in a very large field of doing brain imaging for people with obsessive compulsive disorder that there really is this OCD circuit in the brain, and that yes, you can use medications to help treat it. There's no doubt about that, but it's not just medications and that you can use changes in understanding and changes in how you focus your attention to also change your brain in ways that are similar to how medication can change your brain. And when you do that, it helps, it helps you manage the symptoms and, and then it even helps the symptoms decrease in intensity. This does shed light on us not just being our brain because um, if we were just our brain, then we really wouldn't have any sense of choice about how we responded to these things. Now, a lot of people, when they have OCD, really feel like they don't have very much choice. So, so, so that's where the real... Uh, clinical battle happens. And of course, when you primarily treat it with medication, um, or even when you primarily treat it with um, behavioral approaches that don't take into account this capacity that people have to reinterpret it and change their focus of attention, because, because you can treat obsessive compulsive disorder with behavioral methods that have a lot in common with how you train animals. And, and I'm not particularly making the claim that animals are anything much more than their brain. Um, maybe they are, but that, you know, it's not my department and it's not a claim I would make. But I'm certainly making the claim that people are more than their brains. So the, the part of the approach to treating obsessive compulsive disorder, which was kind of at the baseline of this bigger 
um, theoretical, philosophical approach that I've done a lot more with since those days in the 80s and the 90s um, was this issue of, sure, you could take medications and, sh and sure, you could do sort of ba basic behavioral approaches that have significant amounts in common with training an animal. Um, and they work. And, and so there's no controversy. You know, they're helpful. They work. But, but the thing that makes it theoretically interesting is what an animal can't do is really understand, wait a second, I'm getting this feeling, but it's not who I am. It's not me. It's, it's a false message that's coming from inside of me, from my brain. And, and that's the part that where you really get, get the leverage to say, well, you're not just your brain because you, you're understanding, you're actually understanding and making a selection of what you're going to focus your attention on that takes into account that what you're responding to is a message from your brain and that you're not going to listen to it. Several years ago, I wrote this book called You Are Not Your Brain, which, which really um, brings it right home to everyday life. And in that book, we talk about, I wrote, I wrote it with actually another psychiatrist named Rebecca Gladding, who was actually a resident at UCLA at the time when we started writing the book. And um, she was kind of a student of my approach to treating obsessive compulsive disorder for quite a few years before we worked together on that book. And um, in that book, we have a concept called the wise advocate. And that concept of the wise advocate leads um, to discovering your true self. So, so that's where you're more than your brain. I mean, because there's, there's, there's certainly no argument. I mean, and you know, any, I've been doing neuroscience for over 40 years. I mean, and neuroscience really believes that the brain is, has a lot of effects and does a lot of amazing things. And I certainly believe that too, because, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be a neuroscientist. But I, what I don't believe is that every aspect of a person can be explained by just those brain mechanisms. And that, and that, and that when you start talking about, on the one hand, having a true self and that, and that you're making choices about what to focus your attention on to develop that true self, then you get a concept that really isn't in neuroscience, this concept of the wise advocate. So, so the wise advocate is what we sometimes summarize as your inner loving guide, that every person has access inside of themselves to um, you, you know, an inner narrative, and obviously in various spiritual systems it could be understood in in a variety of ways and that's fine too so so the concept the wise advocate concept is very intimately related and in fact but was developed by me after many years of study of mindfulness and mindfulness is something that now everybody seems to know what it basically what it is or at least they've heard of it they might not know what it is but they've heard of it and and um so, so mindfulness is something that I've spent many, many years practicing and studying, over 40 years practicing and studying. And, and um, mindfulness is basically taking a third person, outer perspective on your own inner experience. And another uh, saying or term that, that I still use sometimes that, that I used to use more um, before the wise advocate concept came, comes from the very the father of modern economics named Adam Smith, who was a, a Scottish philosopher in, in the 1700s. And he had a, con a concept called the impartial spectator. And that impartial spectator for him was, was very important in how people make decisions about what's ethically right and what's ethically wrong. And the impartial spectator was basically, again, sort of the, 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 the observer, the clear-minded observer or 
clear-minded observers in Adam Smith's system that gives you a perspective on, you know, is this the right thing to do or is this the wrong thing to do? And and so in some ways, it's the word conscience has something quite related to it, but it's it's more than just your conscience, though. Conscience, though, it's actually far more than than just your conscience because. Conscience basically usually is understood as as something that's kind of, you know, wagging a finger at you saying, don't do that, do that, don't do that. Whereas the impartial spectator is more observing. And then the wise advocate is really more than that. Because we take this description of inner loving guide very seriously. And, and what we take especially seriously is the notion that you can have an inner narrative with this inner loving guide and talk things over. And and it's in the process of talking things over from a perspective of observing sort of where you're coming from, you know, what are you thinking? What are you planning? What are you trying to do? What are you and then what are your long term goals? And all of those kinds of questions Sure, neuroscience has a lot to say about the front part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex and the role that the prefrontal cortex plays in goal-directed behavior. That's straight neuroscience, largely human neuroscience, but honestly, even monkeys you can study that in. And, and, um, but what's not really neuroscience is how do you decide what your goals are? I mean, so once you have a goal, yeah, the brain has a lot to do with pursuing that goal and especially keeping your attention on track of that goal. What neuroscience doesn't have a whole, whole, whole lot to say about is how you choose these goals. And, 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 and that's, and that, and, 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 but that's really kind of where the you are not your brain concept really has its full written richness. Because what we're trying to do is tie an understanding of the brain to help you, every individual person, um, make better choices about what goals they do decide to pursue. So it helps, it helps if you understand your brain to understand how habit center works, to understand how sort of reward mechanisms work, to understand how attention focusing actually works. I mean, you know, one, you know, one of the things by knowing the front of the brain is very important in attention focusing is, you know, don't do things that damage the front of your brain, like too much substance abuse will damage the front of your brain, etc. So, 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 so these are all, you know, it helps to understand your brain, but what you still need the inner narrative to make decisions and choices about what you actually want to pursue. And that's, that's really where the, the big part of the you are not your brain concept comes in, because the mind in this system is choices and decisions that we make about what to pay attention to. And, and you can almost say that everything except those choices and decisions basically are determined by the brain. I mean, so all your freedom comes in the choices and decisions that you make about what you pay attention to. And all the input largely actually is just the brain. So, so, so you have to filter through what the brain is sending into you, and it's in that filtering and in those choices that you make that this whole wise advocate concept, pursuing a true self, becomes very important, and that's what we understand by you are not your brain. Well, if you're just your brain, you're really not very different than a robot. And... People who are really dedicated to believing it's all the brain will say, yes, I'm basically just a robot. But a lot of people who think that they want it to all be the brain will go, actually, I don't really want to think I'm a robot. And, and, and so then you have to start thinking about, well, what is the difference between you and a robot? Do you believe there's a difference between you and a robot? And if you do, that's when you get into this issue of, genuinely making choices and decisions based on your own sort of sense of an inner loving guide connecting with you. The other big argument, philosophical dispute that you get in with to with people 
who think that way is that they genuinely want to be committed to the, the, the belief that science can answer every question. So a lot of the cultural battle that goes on is around the issue of whether science can answer every question. And in our current culture, that's a hard battle that is really being fought out every day in the culture at large. And, and so a lot of the difference between the two sides really boils down to, do you think science can answer absolutely every question? And, and, and people who really want to believe in genuine choice and want to believe that human beings are intrinsically different than robots do not believe, and I do not believe, that science can answer every single question, that, that science can totally describe what a human being is. Even though, as a neuroscientist who's had some reasonable success in advancing the field of neuroscience, especially you know, around the subject of obsessive compulsive disorder, um, you know, I, I believe that we ha have shown that, sure, there are brain mechanisms that explain why people have those symptoms, and science can understand why they have those symptoms. Science does not explain very well why some people give in to those symptoms, why some people resist those symptoms, why some people are more, you know, willing to sort of resist those symptoms, why other people don't have the wherewithal to resist those symptoms. I mean, even people who want to say science can answer those questions do not claim that science has answered those questions. So there are a lot of questions that everybody goes, well, we haven't answered those questions yet. And then we're left with the two sides that says science will answer that. And then you have the side that I'm more representative of that go, nope, there are things that science just is not going to answer. I have a name for the people who think that science explains everything. I call them science worshipers. I mean, you know, they have their, and I, and I actually call the belief that science can answer every question a form of a fundamentalist religious belief because I think believing that science can answer every single question is in fact a form of a fundamentalist religious belief. And um, not everyone shares that fundamentalist belief. There's lots of people, especially common among, you know, creative, artistic oriented people, and then a lot of just regular people, right? I mean, now a lot, you know, the science people will say, well, that's just because they don't understand science. But, but I mean, yeah. I know enough people, you know, it's not, in this day and age right now, it's no longer the majority of scientists, especially in biological sciences. Um, a lot of people in biological sciences lean towards, you know, th that belief that science will answer, can in p potentially can, an can answer everything. But that too is an interesting historical development because, because you know, there's been many times in the past when, when um, scientists didn't believe that at all. And, and one of my favorite scientists who I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years studying is um, the, the inventor of the computer, <laughs> Blaise Pascal, who invented the first calculating machine. In fact, I'm no, I'm no computer expert, but I think Pascal is one of the first, if not the first computer language named after him. No one argues that he invented the first calculating machine. He's clearly one of the great mathematicians that ever lived, and no one denies he was a great scientist. But if, if, if you read his book in French called Pensée, which means thoughts, he'll tell you very, very, very clearly that science is very important, science is very powerful, but there are the most important questions, Pascal says as eloquently as almost anyone has ever said it, right up there near the top, that's why we're still reading him 400 years later, is, is that, you know, science does not answer the most important questions. And, that, and that's actually what I also think. The most important questions science does not answer.
It all gets in to the subject of how do you interpret the brain data? I mean, you know, like what, how do you understand the limits of what brain data can explain? And, and, and then how do you understand the, the, the way we approach the questions that are beyond our current limits? And, you know, fr from, from a sort of National Science Foundation perspective, the answer is, let's just do more science. Well, I mean, yes and no, because, I mean, even the concept of what science is is a historical cultural concept that can sort of expand and contract. And, and, and this belief that material causation and that physical brain mechanisms alone explain all aspects of a person it's a pretty recent onset. I mean, it doesn't have a deep historical base, that belief. It really doesn't. Charles Sherrington, who's one of the greatest neuroscientists who ever lived, no one would deny that. No one. He's one of the founders of the field of modern neuroscience. He assertively did not believe that, that, that the brain can explain all aspects of what a person is. <laughs> like, I, you know, who I am, where did I grow up, who, do, who are my parents? What is my culture? What is my faith? What do I believe? How, how, how do these things influence how I interpret the world? And we are not even almost close to understanding those kinds of questions in brain terms. And I don't think we ever will, actually.